Hello and welcome to this AIM North America series on unique device identification education. AIM North America is an alliance enabling the cooperation, development, and standardization of AIDC technologies. From barcodes to RFID to IoT, AIM North America is your advocate. Any organization with an interest in data collection is a beneficiary of these efforts. Membership provides an opportunity to influence the direction of the industry, develop policies and standards, access market reports, and engage new partners. Before we get started, there are a few housekeeping items I would like to go over. First is the AIM antitrust policy. It is a policy of AIM North America to conduct its operations in strict compliance with the antitrust laws. No AIM activity shall create even the appearance of a violation of the letter or spirit of the antitrust laws. Next is our collaboration and work product policy. AIM presentations like today's are held for the primary purpose of advancements in our industry. AIM has developed this policy for the protection of its members who engage in this important collaborative effort. Some other housekeeping notes. You are muted throughout the presentation. If you have questions for our speaker, there will be a Q&A at the end of the presentation. Please submit those questions anytime by using the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen. Also, a recording of today's presentation will be made available. Today, I'm here with Norich Manon, the founder of Covesis. Today, he will be discussing the VTAG, a novel approach to meeting UDI compliance. Norich, welcome and please take it away. Thank you so much, Michael uh, and AIM. Um, well, we told, the title says as we are we're going to discuss a novel VTAG solution. Uh, the solution is definitely novel, but it's not new to the industry. Uh, we are um, very grateful and humbled by the honor we received last year for some case study work that we presented in collaboration with the Department of Defense on how our technology helps uh, tr uh, address certain urgent problems in supply chain traceability. Um, both for, and we're going to build on that theme today. Uh, so Covisis has been around for many years and our business is all focused on developing a covert intrinsic tagless solution for item level traceability. Uh, our solution really enables manufacturers and distributors to, uh, to, provide, to have end-to-end -end traceability without having to change their product or their packaging. In addition to meeting regulatory mandates, uh, we, our solution is results in the highest cost efficiency for all parties within the supply chain. And we are today gonna to talk about how we work in partnership with government and industrial sector, industry sector leaders uh, to deal with uh, the problem in medical devices, how to provide unique device identification to meet regulations. The subject has some controversy um, but with everybody we have worked with, um, we have always found that all parties truly care about patient safety. And we have seen time and time again that traceability is equal, equates to patient safety. Um, this traces back to um, the GAO reports, which were kind of the precursors of FDA regulations on UDI um, more than 15 years ago, 20 years ago. Um, uh, what the purpose being, uh, we want to be able to track patients who have medical devices implanted to them um, without um, truly to end-to-end -to -end traceability so that we can, in the event of a recall, we can actually recover and address the problems. Uh, more recently, uh, we have all already found, and um, this is a different discussion perhaps, that traceability, true traceability also enables prevention of counterfeits and part diversion. Um, and there are multiple uh, house regulations uh, under consideration as we speak to address um, a medical device uh, counterfeiting. Um, I want to thank uh, Jay Crowley from, um, for helping me put these, this particular uh, slide together. Um, the US FDA UDI regulations, uh, final regulations remove the requirement for implants to be directly marked based on the assumption that the UDI of the implant would be made available through its label. Now, this is all fine and good. However, UDI regulations do not work for non-sterile implants that are distributed and replenished in sets and trays because they are not, there are no real labels to place on the device. 
uh, this is a real challenge and that's the, the, uh, the premise of what we're going to discuss and how our solution uh, VTAG enables a, a, a path forward. FDA does require laborers to develop and implement approaches that are and they ensure that the UDI is readily available at the point of use. And uh, there are some very exciting ways that they are being implemented today that also I'll touch base on. But we, don't, we are still looking for a perfect solution. Now, the, the, although the FDA UDI regulations is a precursor, um, this has now become a global uh, requirement. And as we see this happening in Europe, as well as in Saudi Arabia and um, other parts of Asia, uh, there are looming regulations that really will require medical device devices all the way from a few millimeter size implantable orthopedic screw to, um, to its instrumentation, all to be traced to the patient's medical records um, through full traceability. So what is the non-sterile challenge that we, uh, we touch base on? You know, for most sterile packages, this is not an issue because you have a sterile package, uh, medical devices inside, such as a heart transplant valve, uh, a pacemaker, a pacemaker. So all of them come in sterile packages, uh, the date code and lot code, and even individual serial information is available on the package itself. When it comes to implantables, um, especially orthopedic implantables, the problem is that this date code and lot code is in, on a package and that package is separated from the part because those parts are now placed on surgical trays or, and as in shown here as in screw racks. So the label is lost when the parts are loaded into uh, the racks and trays. Um, and that kind of means that the, uh, the, uh, the the, the UDI information is not available at the time of use. Now, there are many ways that have been attempted to address this problem. And we're gonna talk about how we address this through a, uh, an approach that provides intrinsic uh, traceability. This is very complex, as you can imagine. The, um, a surgical tray, uh, multiple surgical trays can be used in a trauma, uh, during a trauma. Um, and each tray contains, uh, contains high mix of parts some as small as a few millimeters in size, such as guide wires and particle screws, and they're often impossible to mark. And even if you can mark them, um, it's impossible to read during the time of surgery. So this has why we kind of have all these challenges from um, uh, implementing at the point of use. And, uh, and there are experts on this call, I'm told, who can give you more flavor and color to the details of this implementation, but I'm trying to kind of condense the problem into a very sort of a, a compact way of describing the challenge. And, and same with this cartoon of what the, the traditional non-sterile workflow goes from manufacturer to the patient. Uh, this cartoon is incredibly simplistic. There are many, many handoffs in between, many variations thereof. Um, first and foremost, Decades of precedence has shown that surgeons prefer non-sterile parts, especially during trauma. Um, when I say non-sterile parts, it doesn't mean they're using non-sterile uh, implantables. These parts are sterilized at the hospital before surgery and they're used um, in surgery, but they show up at the hospital in non-sterile packages. So uh, what happens is uh, manufacturers through the supplier, through the sales reps provide uh, the service where these pa packages of implantables and instruments show up at the hospital. They are then and either placed in the entire um, surgical trays uh, where they are, or they're replenished um, the existing surgical trays. And then they're sent to, sent to central supplier where they're sterilized and they show up at surgery. Why is it that surgeons prefer this? This is because precedent has shown and uh, lots of historical data has shown that this enables faster surgery. A surgeon is able to call out the tool or the implant screw that they need, and they're able to quickly um, put it inside, um, place it within the patient during surgery, 
um, and um, reducing the time that the patient is under uh, on the surgical table. And more importantly, it also reduces infection because you are sterilizing through rigorously at the hospital itself. Um, and so this is, again, very important for the patient's safety. Hospitals ideally do not want to own uh, all the equipment that they uh, have to hold in, in, uh, inside their uh, inventory. They prefer, in many cases, loaner kits, uh, where these surgical trays are cycled from the hospital back to the manufacturer. Again, these are, there are many variations of this workflow. I'm just giving a sort of a high level view and we can get into a lot more details uh, as you unravel. And we've worked on this project for over three years, looking at various variations of how the workflow uh, for, um, to support a non-sterile uh, can be implemented. And, and the fundamental reason for some of this workflow as has evolved over decades is it lowers the total cost of ownership for the hospitals and cost recovery for the manufacturers. But this workflow is not conducive to the current requirements for uh, traceability. Um, there are multiple GS1 mandated uh, approved technologies for to meet traceability and they work very well in, in all, most cases. But the challenge really comes down to uh, what do we do with very tiny parts, which cannot be directly marked because if you directly mark a two millimeter screw, it's almost impossible to read um, at the time of use. And worse, uh, some of these um, markings require you to either requalify the parts or, um, or even remark them after multiple sterilization cycles. There are lots of new technologies that have been implemented, uh, being experimented and piloted, which includes RFID-based um, uh, readers. Uh, but the, at the end of the day, hospitals are challenged with a whole range of different solutions coming down the road for them. And each one requires a, a significant uh, technological elements to be implemented. And we have to try and find one, a, a solution set that is least disruptive to the workflow. So would we have, so before I go, you know, so it's not all doom and gloom. Um, there are current solutions that have been uh, negotiated and put in place for um, implantables uh, in the US. Uh, primarily it uses, um, an example here is a, is a Johnson Johnson's um, UDI web-based web service, which allows, which solves a large part of the problem by uh, and providing UDI information on a part shipped at the time of, uh, at the hospital. But it really is missing that one piece, which is associating the data with the part um, um, at the time of use. And that's sort of what we have been working on. What is, what is, what's our technology? Our technology is unique because what it does is it does not require you to directly mark your part, does not require you to alter your part, but because we take a photograph non-invasive, non-contact method, which captures the surface texture of the part uh, at the micro microscopic level. And from that texture, we're able to create a fingerprint, which we call virtual tag or V-tag, that allows us to do full end-to-end -end traceability through the life cycle of the part. For other projects and other industrial sectors, we also develop classifiers that allows us to segregate a part by its uh, source of origin. But for the purposes of UDI, we're focusing on traceability. And if there are any questions about how VTAGs work, um, um, they have been validated by multiple industrial sectors, especially the Department of Defense, and a lot more information is available on our website. The number one question we had to validate were, as, as we started this pro program, was whether VTAG will work on the variety of parts that are available that are used during surgery, especially orthopedic surgery? And the answer is, quick answer is yes. We work with all types of material, plastic, metal, rubber. Uh, there are uh, um, uh, orthopedic instruments, as some of you may know, which have wooden handles. Um, we work with them too. So it's really designed to work with legacy parts. So you don't have to go and 
change the billions of dollars that are invested in existing tools and equipment and uh, uh, production workflows. Um, and, it's, it's, and you can integrate VTAX by just capturing a photograph. And we have also run it through multiple sterilization cycles and it survives because every time we run a sterilization cycle, we are capturing the image and we are, we are able to create the VTAG and continue to create that association. So what we, so is one thing to, uh, is, is to have a technology that works. Uh, the other is to develop a solution. Uh, what we are here, what we worked in the past many years is to develop, sorry. Um, was to develop a comprehensive solution that'll meet the regulatory mandates and at the most cost-effective uh, way possible. For that, we architectured what we call a virtual bill of material or VBOM for every surgical tray. And each of those surgical trays, every item inside the surgical tray is V-tagged. And when we V-tag um, an item, we associate its data, which is in this case, device identifier, the product identifier, DIPI, which is captured from the label using a, either a BARC or an RFID. We capture the information on the label and associate it with the part using this virtual link called VTAG. And all VTAGs are then made available in a collective ensemble for a tray as a, as a virtual bill of material. And to assist in the workflow, we develop multiple instrumentation from a fully automated um, gantry system. And I'll show you videos of each of these systems, uh, each one of those uh, these icons uh, in the next three slides. The first machine is really meant to, um, is, is the core is a benchtop device that allows you to take any part, any size, place it on the, on the uh, scanner. And just like a, um, uh, like a device that you would use in, in a grocery store allows you to enroll and verify the part. Uh, and then the whole process can be automated in the cases of tiny orthopedic implant screws. And all the data is made available in the in, in a um, iPad-based solution through a cloud interface where ER, data from an ERP system, we don't develop new ERP systems. We create, create links to ERP systems at the hospital as well as the uh, manufacturer. So let me start with the first video. This is kind of walking you through the process of how a benchtop device works. And um, um, in the, to be efficient with time, I'm just gonna walk, uh, talk through the whole process. So the first step is, so here's an example of how a 1.5 millimeter matrix screw is enrolled and verified. The first step is to, ta uh, is to take the screw to identify the DI of the screw um, and, in, and all the information of the DI and PI are barcode scanned onto uh, our database to make the link. And at the time of creating the link, um, we are, this is a, a live feed of what the screw looks like in a camera. On the, left, on the right side is a macro view so that uh, assists the user to place it. And on the left side is an actual view of what shows up in our VTAC scanner data. And as the screw is placed uh, at, at a touch, the, uh, the image is captured, uh, a VTAG is created, and the data that we had um, initially read in is either associated with the part, or in this case, when during verification, um, uh, it tells you what the IP, uh, PI of that part was. So in the next video, we show the same process, and, and we can do this repeatedly for any instrument, um, any size part. Um, as you can see, the scale is designed for that. Um, in this video, we show you how this can all, for screws, because they come in screw trays, how the whole process can be automated uh, using um, uh, a gantry system that we develop. Um, this, is a, this was a pre-production video. Uh, the production system was shipped uh, to, our, to our collaborators. So what you see on the left-hand side is, as, uh, sorry, what you see right now in the screen. Let me go back a second. I'm going to pause for a second. So this is the view on the screen um, that, you, that the user sees, gives you the whole view of all the places where the screws are to be placed or have been placed. In this case, this is a verification process that we are showing. So the screw rack, which is placed at this, you can see on the right-hand corner under our gantry system. 
Uh, the left-hand corner is a cartoon version of that entire screw rack um, because we know what the screw rack type is. Uh, the screw rack type is, uh, and it pulls up the image of the screw rack type. And what you see on these dots are where we are scanning. So when it's yellow, this means that we have captured an image of the part. And if it is verified, it turns green. If there is an erroneous screw that's placed inside the, the screw rack, say from maybe another vendor or from another, another, another tray, which does not belong to the set, then we, the, screw, the, the dot after a scan becomes turns red. So that kind of is a simple red, yellow, green, and red scheme. So, oh, sorry. Let's go through this for a second. So, path. So as the gantry starts scanning, it's almost impossible to see that the gantry is moving, but it's actually capturing images um, and processing VTAGs in less than three seconds per screw. Um, and, um, and the information, as now this is the sort of the uh, zoom, zoomed in view of what we actually see. All these screws are being scanned. They are actually green because they have been verified that this is, this is where the screw belongs. So that screw can be, uh, moved around within the screw rack, but it should not be something that came from another uh, part, a screw rack or from another uh, vendor. So you can take screw A, like the stop screw on the top and place it here. As long as it belongs in that set, you'll still verify it as green. Uh, if it doesn't belong to the set, you verify it as red. As you see, um, this is the rate at which it's capturing. And we go through. So this one turned red because that we purposely put as a validation check to show that that screw doesn't belong there. Again, this takes uh, the the image capture takes a few milliseconds. Um, the motion from one part to the other takes um, um, takes um, um, about less than three seconds. After we do all this, how do we make the data available at the hospital? So we developed a, um, an a, uh, iPad-based solution that actually has three simple, uh, uh, at the point of surgery, how we can actually track the, uh, the part and its data. So all the data gets associated with, um, at the it is made available at the hospital and we developed uh, way of a simple way of tracking uh, the uh, patient procedure. So it starts with um, a screen where you have a screen of multiple uh, options. Um, you enter the credentials of the surgery and at the as, as you prepare the surgery, the first step you do is you scan each of the surgical trays. In this case, you're showing an example of barcodes. Um, this, each of the surgical trays show up with barcodes. And, and when you scan the uh, barcodes, you are able to extract the virtual bill of materials shows up um, at the, at the, uh, uh, onto their tablet. But now this is a, so prior to surgery, the scrub nurse, so this is intended to be used within the sterile field. Uh, you use a camera of the iPad, you scan um, with the tool, you scan each of the trays, all the information in the tray shows up, all the PIDI is available at the, uh, during surgery. Um, and then during surgery, um, uh, as you move, once the procedure is prepped and the, uh, uh, during the procedure, as you see up here, uh, the, the, the scrub nurse or whoever is assisting the surgery just selects what just touches the part. And at that time, um, the, with the, uh, that it was used during surgery and you can enter either cancel it or enter notes say that uh, this particular screw that they tried to use was damaged or and therefore should be discarded. All that information is tracked uh, just using this iPad and then uploaded to the cloud at the end of the procedure by just touching the upload button. And once it's done, uh, post-surgery, you can reconcile um, what was used during surgery, compare notes, uh, make any final edits, and then press on that uh, upload button again and all that data gets sent 
to the um, to the manufacturer. So this whole system is designed to work as software as a service uh, with hardware um, uh, systems to be deployed and managed. And even we even enable our, uh, our customers to manage their own hardware. We provide that under license um, and all data is shared through tokens issued through the cloud so that it integrates easily with the ERP systems of our manufacturers, hospitals. Um, and because we don't actually change the ERP system, we provide tokens that allow you to exchange, just like a barcode is, can be a token, B tag is a token that allows you to associate information rapidly uh, with uh, different yeah, across uh, uh, databases. And we have tested and implemented this uh, in one of the projects we tested and validated the V tags that were uh, implemented uh, in the US and, in, and validated in Australia. Uh, and a number of pilots have uh, been done to show how fast the latency and the accuracy of our V tag system. So, once again, quickly to recap um, uh, V tags are. are tagless part level identification technology um, designed to uh, really designed uh, to, uh, to be a non-invasive, non-contact way to um, um, track and trace items. And this uh, enables you to avoid handling and warranty issues, uh, no requalification uh, or reworking of your systems are required. Uh, it does not change your article or its packaging. Is 100% accurate, um, and we have validated that uh, for multiple industrial sectors as well as med devices and survives cleaning cycles. Um, enrollment and verification of the article can be done anywhere a production, distribution, hospital, central supply. Um, um, and is really, we have created an end to end solution that allows the data to be available uh, within the sterile field using a tablet based um, integration portal. Uh, it's easy to operate requires minimum training and anybody who knows how to take a photograph um, can take um, uh, use the system to guide them through the process and uh, capture a VTAG. Um, and the digital thread is available at the part level. And secure complete part history and digital travelers are also associated in the database and it complies with regulatory directives. Uh, we we, like I mentioned earlier, we work directly with, customer, with our, um, our partners. Um, our customers are our partners and we develop bespoke solutions, uh, hardware solutions and multiple configurations have been made all the way from handheld devices um, to fully automated robotic platforms um, and, and in between multiple portable platforms for different industrial partners, uh, really to design to work with their workflow. Any questions, comments? All right, thank you, Nareesh. Appreciate your information today. And we do have some, so I'll get to those if you are ready. I am. Awesome. Uh, first question we have is, can environmental factors on the surface texture affect the ability of a VTAG to be scanned? Uh, could you say that again, environmental factors? Can environmental factors on the surface texture affect the ability of a VTAG to be scanned? I'm not sure what uh, environmental factors are. For us, um, uh, we, we need a line of sight to the item. Um, so we, it should be in a package uh, um, unless the package is highly transparent um, and we need to be, and it's using a white light source. So environmental factors, we have tested it against our uh, temperature cycling, autoclaves. Um, as long as the surface is not completely abraded, uh, we are able to recover uh, the VTAG. And uh, will a VTAG change over time? It will not change over time as long as the surface is not abraded. So gentle, like you wear and tear, like scratches, absolutely do not affect VTAG. What does affect the VTAG is a full abrasion. So our workflow, as we show uh, at each stage, um, the part is enrolled and verified and then, uh, and then validated through the validation process, any changes or bit errors in the VTAG are recorrected. So uh, the VTAG is constantly updated every time it's used. 
So any drift in the V tag is corrected for. Okay, great, thanks. And um, can custom configurations be made available? Yes, absolutely. So what our intellectual property and um, our whole work is, this is based on how we integrate camera with lighting to extract um, the, the uh, image needed so that we can run the compression algorithms needed to create the VTAG consistently from uh, multiple use, multiple sites. Um, so but based on the user's configuration needs, we can definitely customize it. And we have done that many, many times. Great, and this question kind of, I think goes along with that, how unique are V tags? So we have shown data that we, uh, so for example, in, in the set of screws, we have done multiple studies where we've shown that the chances of a false positive are in the order of 10 to the negative 40 or, or lower. So uh, and these are studies that we've done with thousands of screws. Uh, we've enrolled it, verified it, autoclaved it, revalidated it. And so uh, we are very confident that once the VTAG is captured, unless the part is fully abraded or uh, destroyed, um, we will be able to recover the VTAG. Great. And this question, uh, they're basically asking, could you tell us more about the time it takes to scan the devices? Do each of the screws need to be scanned individually, for example? And how much time does each scan take? Sure. So um, uh, the time is really based on how, whether we are allowed, when, if we can integrate an automated system or not. For us to take a photograph, it takes a, a fraction of a second, a few milliseconds to capture an image. But the time is really spent in the user placing the part under it as camera uh, on the system. So to overcome some of the delays, we have developed automated systems, robotic systems, and of course, benchtop system for manual use. So the automated systems, uh, the fastest we've gone as we showed in that video uh, for the gantry system is less than three seconds per screw. Yes, we do need to, uh, to capture a VTAG in the case of screws, you have to image each screw. And um, um, we can come up with configurations with a lot of different optical field of views to capture more, more than one screw per, uh, per scan but it really is not the best way forward. We have found the best way to do it is one screw at a time, and it takes up uh, less than three seconds per screw scan. Now, we have seen and we have, we have timed this within the workflow uh, of, uh, of, of a distribution center, and we have found that while the screws are being scanned, the operator typically has a lot of other paperwork to do. Um, they're in parallel working on other instruments within the set, uh, calibrating the systems, opening packages. So all that workflow runs in parallel. And we have you've seen actually at the end of the day, it actually saves time dramatically because you know, you're not redoing uh, uh, parts, you're not, uh, not kind of unsure of what part was used where. So we have actually found that although we are, uh, we do take time, uh, it actually saves time in the, in, the, in the immediate and definitely the long run. Hope that answered the question. I think it did, and we do have your contact listed there uh, if uh, there needs more clarification. Um, another question we've received is how does one know where the VTAG is on the part in order to scan it? That's a great question. So what we see that when, we, when a part is placed on our scanner, uh, we know what that part is based on either the user selecting it, what the part type is, or um, our own machine vision system guiding the user saying where the part is to be placed. So we need to, our V tags are, uh, have a field of view, image camera image, a field of view of a few centimeters. Uh, we need to place a part within that window. Um, and as long as it's within the window that a human can place, which is say half a centimeter or so, uh, we're able to recover it. So you, we don't need um, uh, exact, like a microscopic precision of placing it, we're able to correct our um, the placement of the part within you know, within half a centimeter and any orientation. So, for example, a screw, uh, a V tag is you know, as you can imagine, it's placed on the surface. And this is an image capture. It doesn't matter whether the screw is in the right rotated orientation. A single image capture, and we can recover V tag from it.
Great. Uh, another question uh, we have is does VTAG work on mirror surfaces? Uh, yes, actually, some, as you would imagine, some of these parts are extremely uh, high reflective surfaces and VTAGs work very well. We have optimized our system to make sure uh, we can capture texture. The, the, the more polished and more mirrored it is, it becomes a little bit more complicated, but at, at, at the texture, at the pro, at the sort of the physics interface that we work at, which is at the micron level surface, there's always texture and we are always able to recover texture and um, surface information that allows us to create the VTAC. Great, another question we've received is, can the iPad read the VTAG? Uh, it's not ideally meant to read VTAGs. We, we have created adapt, uh, like adapted features that allow us to create a consistency in the camera uh, because I, iPad cameras vary, um, consistent in the camera and lighting, but we prefer that the iPad be used for what is best at, which is as a user interface and um, um, not really count on that for uh, VTAC capture. But we have created um, attachments to iPads and iPhones to capture the tags. Okay, and we'll just end on this question. If there are other questions that you have, once again, uh, Narish has kindly uh, provided his contact information uh, so you can uh, reach out to him with those questions. But I'll end this one with uh, the question, I know this is a UDI-centric webinar series, but what are some examples, if you can, of other industries these tags can or could work in? So we have um, implemented um, um, VTAGs and, and that's sort of the case report that's already on the AIM website uh, for, uh, for traceability of uh, microelectronic components for the military. Uh, we are also working with the US Air Force uh, for meeting the IUID requirements, which is similar to UDI, which is uh, just a few other initials. It's called intrinsic unique uh, identifiers, which is a mandate in the Department of Defense, just like the FDA mandate is for med devices, uh, which requires any item that's over $3,000 to contain uh, um, part source, manufacturer data. Uh, um, and so we have implemented solutions to deal with, um, uh, so as you can imagine, some aircraft parts uh, cannot have a UDI signature or any, any part marking or labels on it because they're in high temperature environments and it could actually damage the performance of the part if you put the direct mark, part market. So we are working with the US Air Force in uh, addressing those problems um, with VTAGs. VTAGs have been implemented uh, in um, microtronic industry for both for fighting counterfeits as well as providing full traceability. Uh, so those are two major sectors in you know, defense sectors. Uh, we are also working with automotive industry uh, with the similar issues of uh, during recalls, do we know where the part actually came from, which factory it came from, and is it is it actually the manufactured part or is it a counterfeit? Well, uh, thank you for your time and insights today, Narich. Appreciate it greatly. Absolutely, thank you so much, everybody, for attending, and thank you, Aim. <laughs>